good, good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, this webinar as part of the Urban Tree Festival on trees and social housing. Um, I'm Neil Sinden uh, from CPRE London, um, and uh, we're hosting the, this event. Um, we're going to wait a few minutes for uh, participants to join us, uh, and we'll kick off reasonably promptly in a minute or so. Um, thanks for joining us, and um, I hope you enjoy this webinar. While we're waiting, I should say um, uh, thanks ever so much for supporting the Urban Tree Festival um, uh, and signing up for this event. If you've donated, thank you very much. If you haven't um, managed to donate uh, uh, before now, um, please consider doing so after this event if you've, if you've enjoyed it. Um, uh, and there'll be information about how to do that pasted, being pasted in the chat bar um, during, the, during the presentations. Uh, and also do keep an eye on the chat bar for further for further um, information about uh, about the pre presenters and the projects they're talking about uh, and indeed other events happening as part of the urban tree festival uh, and um, uh, we're going to be taking questions we hope at the end if we have time i'm sure we will i hope we will uh, using the q a panel which i'm sure you're all familiar with now which is at the bottom towards the right of your um, zoom screen uh, I think that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over now for this session to um, Christina from Trees for Cities, who will be chairing uh, the webinar. Christina, over to you. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, I hope everyone is uh, pretty much here. Um, so uh, welcome, everyone, um, and thanks very much for joining us uh, with this webinar, Trees and Social Housing. It is great to have so many of you here today. Uh, it's a vitally important discussion and we hope that it's the first of many to come. So today we're going to look um, at a variety of different organisations and community groups who have worked really hard to improve the quality of green spaces within those urban uh, landscapes. So without further ado, uh, please let me introduce you to our speakers and the first of which is Dr Phil Askew. Uh, Dr Phil Askew is the Director and Landscape uh, and place making at Peabody, um, one of London's oldest and largest uh, housing associations with around 55,000 properties across London and the South East. He's also a world class leader in large scale landscape and urban projects. So it's a privilege to hear from him from uh, today. Uh, Phil, thank you very much for joining us. You look like you're ready to rock and roll. No worries. Thank you, Christine. And thank you very much for inviting me today. I think it's um, uh, such a fundamental issue and one that I'm really pleased is going right up the agenda at, at, at pace, if you like, um, mm. planting trees, urban greening, um, <clears throat> etc. So I know I've got an awful lot of slides in 15 minutes. Just checking, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Yes, that's absolutely yeah, thank fine. Thanks, Good. Phil. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is tell you about our project in Thamesmead. Um, uh, and some of the work we're doing there uh, with a little bit of a focus on trees, but um, uh, on the whole, a focus on, on green infrastructure. Um, so, so um, yeah, my name is Phil Askew. I'm Director of Landscape and Placemaking for Peabody in Thamesmead. Um, it's a project which um, we've been working closely on for the last four or five years, um, but it's a long-term project and Peabody being uh, a social landlord, um, it's two things. It's an unusual project for uh, someone like Peabody to get involved with, and that will become clearer as we go through the presentation. Also, um, you know, the good thing is that Peabody take a very long-term view. Um, so the work that we're doing, you know, has, has a significant a time span attached to it, which is really important and positive, especially in terms of landscape-related stuff. So just a little bit about Thamesmead. Um, it's uh, in the east of London, southeast of London, uh, just on the Thames, uh, about 20, 25 minutes from Charing Cross Station by train uh, in central London. Um, unusually, it's the result of a GLC master plan um, for a new town in London, uh, which um, was conceived in the 60s. Uh, and here you can see the sort of one, one of the early master plans, and you can see the River Thames to the north. Um, Parking in Dagenham, just uh, over the to the north of the Thames there, and Thamesmead to the south. 
uh, and I'll touch on some of the really unusual features of that master plan, some of which was realised, not all of it, um, before the GLC was, was wound up. Um, I, I guess one of the things which many people will know if they know anything about Thamesmead or think, think about Thamesmead is that brutalist con, uh, modernist uh, c concrete housing. And here's a very early photo, which I always find really charming of, of that new housing um, with the higher land of, of Bex Hill, Bexley rather in the background, um, but uh, people enjoying the sort of landscape, enjoying the lakeside setting. Um, and I think, you know, the, the thing to think about Thamesmead at that period was it was a, seen as a, an important part of one solution to London's housing crisis of the time, which was, you know, a crisis of quality. Uh, many people were living in really substandard housing, uh, often packed in without proper sanitation. And Thamesmead was, uh, was, for those people first coming to it, quite remarkable. Um, you know, people had their own space, their own bathrooms, etc., um, and of course access to these fantastic landscape, which I'll touch upon shortly. Um, today, um, it's, it's an, an extensive area of, of South East London, and you can see in this image here, um, just to give a bit of context, the Docklands Airport up here, uh, the River Thames, um, and Thamesmead is in most of this picture here, in fact. It's, it's a town effectively, 45,000 people, 16,000 households of which we own just over five and manage just over 5,000. And it's a pretty big area, it's seven and a half square kilometres in size, which is big enough to drop central London into. Um, and we own a significant proportion of the land, particularly the green and blue space, which I'll be talking about shortly. We have a, a, a plan, which at the moment goes to 2023, and we're in the process of refreshing that. But the key thing is that it's about making the place better, the lived experience. It's about growth and regeneration, which I'll just touch on in a minute. Landscape is a fundamental element. Uh, culture, uh, thinking about placemaking, and of course, working with the community. Lots of change happening in, in Thamesmead, and just in terms of development, it's really very significant. Um, again, central London, Docklands, uh, and the River Thames. Um, we're in the middle of working on a number of very big projects um, in South Thamesmead. We're just completing our first phase of new housing adjacent to Southmere Lake here. Um, and we're going to move on and uh, create some more housing uh, in this area. And indeed, um, we've got long term plans to redevelop a whole area here, very close to Abbeywood Station. Abbeywood Station being um, the first stop or departure point in South East London for Crossrail. Uh, when that comes next year. And of course that will uh, make a massive change in terms of wider connectivity. Over in West Thamesmead, we're working with Barclay Homes on an 1800 home development uh, uh, at this point here. Uh, and then finally, we've just appointed master planners for the waterfront site uh, here, which is uh, going to accommodate in excess of 12,000 new homes and a new town centre with plans to bring the DLR under the Thames and into the town centre here really solving one of the big connectivity issues that Thamesmead has in terms of public transport. So quite a lot going on. Um, over the next uh, 20 years or so, we expect to build in excess of 20,000 new homes. But the thing I want to talk about are our incredible blue and green assets. Um, very unusual for someone like Peabody to, be, uh, to, to take on uh, and manage uh, and work with this sort of scale, if you like, 250 hectares of parks and green space and most critically 32 hectares of water space uh, spread across Thamesmead, very much of it part of the original sort of concept of the 1960s. We have five lakes. This is the Southmere Lake with uh, the four towers overlooking it. Um, we have seven kilometres of canals. Uh, I call it London's largest sub system and I think it was a truly visionary part of that early work of the uh, GLC um, in that all the surface water or at least a significant significant majority of it from uh, roofs from roads from the landscape runs into lakes and canals and, and ultimately into the Thames uh, so, so it's, it's very very unusual um, five kilometers of Thames waterfront uh, here at high tide a magnificent and expansive part of the Thames very different to that upriver in central London and 32 hectares of water and some of it uh, such as here um, one of our smaller lakes, um, you know, you could be, frankly, in Norfolk Broads or other places. And uh, five neighbourhood parks. 
Um, we've got about 33,000 trees in Thamesmead, which is one of the first things that I was told when I got involved in the project, which sort of slightly uh, shocked me in a way. And we uh, we manage we manage those. Um, and, and until relatively recently, uh, we didn't know so much about them, but we're now doing a lot of work on what we've got. And including that, we have about 53 hectares of woodland here. You can see one of the woods, Buttswood as it's called, uh, with a significant number of birches uh, and other species uh, scattered around. Quite fantastic, actually. Extraordinary for us to have these assets. Um, and not within Thamesmead, but to the north of Thamesmead. Um, uh, but I think an important sort of story uh, about trees and woodlands in London, we've got Lesnos Abbey Woods, which is uh, actually um, uh, ancient woodland. Quite fantastic. This was a photograph I only took a few weeks ago of the bluebells in the woods uh, in the hornbeam coppice that you can see here. So a really um, important, uh, may maybe clues to some of the sort of opportunities in Thamesmead as well. Uh, in order to manage all of these trees, we have um, two tree gangs employed almost continuously in working with many of the trees we have. And what we're doing at the moment um, is undertaking a much more detailed evaluation of the sort of stock. Uh, we're actually using uh, the tree economics approach to think about what's the value, what carbon might they sequester, but also uh, using data to enable us to plan for the future. Um, so far with a sort of sample uh, uh, study of 4,000 trees, we've found that the sort of significant species are birch and poplar. Here, poplars having their heads taken out um, because they do get a bit much close to housing. And, and I think that gives us a clue to sort of some of the challenges we may be facing in terms of the future, both of those species being um, relatively short lived. Lots of opportunities for nature conservation, in fact, 14 sites of nature conservation interest within Thamesmead. Um, and, 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 a, and a key part of our work is how do we think about this in a holistic manner? So we've developed a blue and green infrastructure strategy, which we call living in the landscape. And the reason we call it living in the landscape is because we think that Thamesmead's uh, landscape assets uh, are quite unique and provide an extraordinary opportunity for the existing residents and new housing for people to be living in the landscape in this extraordinary biodiverse um, habitat rich area. I've got to speed up. Um, so it's a long term strategy um, uh, and um, it's got a number of themes which I'll just whiz through quite quickly. One is thinking about our waterways and water and how do we deal with that. Wilder Thamesmead, how do we encourage biodiversity, habitat and people to work with that and we have a biodiversity action plan which we're starting to work with now. Productivity is fundamental, people getting their hands dirty. We've got a garden and residence who works with communities to grow and plant. That's schools, that's community groups and many others. An active Thamesmead, really fundamental, working with uh, all ranges of people here in one of our nature study areas uh, with local schools to do forest school type work and get people out into the landscape. And fundamentally making the place connected, both in terms of landscape, but in terms of the ability for people to active travel on foot and uh, uh, and, and by bike, etc. So we hope that by 2050, you know, we will have a much more valuable piece of uh, green space. We'll have more parks, more green space, more habitat, um, and indeed, will bring real value in terms of health and well-being to to the place. And we'll also be thinking about the long-term stewardship of Thamesmead. Nearly there now. Just a few pictures of some of the work that we're doing um, in Southmere. We've been improving and, and cleaning up the lake. Um, putting in floating islands and new reed beds here, fundamental in terms of making the water quality better, but also increasing habitat. Um, in some of the social housing areas, the original ones, this is a, a before picture, we've been transforming the public spaces and courtyards to make them better for people. And here's an image of what it looks like at the moment, uh, completely different um, uh, and a better place for people and, and much welcomed by the people who live around here. Lots of tree planting has happened and we intend to do far more and we're developing an urban forest strategy which will really help drive this going forward. Uh, and finally finishing on, we, on some of the uh, really fun stuff we've been doing which is uh, creating these colourful meadows, in this case sunflowers, um, which last year were um, really popular um, during the pandemic for people to come and visit, uh, run through, film and take their kids to see. That's me, thank you very much.
just almost on time. Thanks very much, Phil. Thanks, Phil. That was really fascinating. Very, so much work happening there. It's just mind boggling, to be honest. Sorry, I had to run at such a speed, but I always there's such, it's such a big story. I'm trying to get as much in as possible. <laughs> no, I know, I know. It's very hard to squeeze something like yeah. that into 15 yes. minutes, that's for yeah. sure. I'm sure we could listen to you for at least two or three hours and not even get halfway through it. So um, I think what we might do, if um, that's all right, uh, we have a, a couple of questions that have come up, um, but if we can maybe uh, direct people to the uh, Q&A box, um, and we'll address a bunch of those questions towards the end, um, if that's all right. So just keeping on track. Uh, next up, we have Claudia Alice's Katie. Claudia has um, overseen the community-led greening project in Racecourse Estate in Ealing. She's worked closely with Ealing Council, residents of Racecourse Estate, and the housing provider and uh, many local community groups to help shape a greener and healthier future for this particular estate. So Claudia, thank you very much for sharing this inspiring project. You look like you're ready to roll. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Okay. I can, yeah, it's yeah. great. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Christina. And thanks, Phil, that was really interesting. Um, so we're going from South East London to North West London in North Holt, Ealing. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit more today about the Racecourse Estate project that we're running in Ealing. Um, so this is a partnership project which we're delivering with Ealing Council and it's kindly funded by the National Lottery. It's a community greening project on a large housing estate in North Holt. Uh, so firstly, just a bit of background on Trees for Cities. Uh, I believe we're presenting at a few of the other webinars this week, uh, but just for those who haven't heard of us before, we come from humble beginnings and we're founded by a few friends who used to organize parties to raise funds for tree planting. So our ethos has remained the same and for nearly 30 years we've been mobilizing communities and cities across the UK and internationally. We have a range of programs and plant trees and deliver greening projects in parks, housing estates, hospitals, streets and schools. We also have school specific programs, most notably our edible playgrounds, which are interactive fruit and vegetable growing teaching spaces on school grounds. Since our inception, we've engaged over 125,000 volunteers to plant over a whopping 1 million trees. And in London, we deliver all of our projects ourselves uh, with our in-house teams and work with local partners in other cities around the UK and internationally. So this project specifically, how did it come about? Um, so the Racecourse Estate project came about due to the strong relationship we have with Ealing Council. We've worked with them since 2010 and have had a long-term strategic partnership since 2016. The estate was a key priority site for the council for other non-greening improvements and fit with our overall objectives, which were to have the greatest social and environmental impact. In particular, there was a lot of expression from residents for additional community activities, for families and children who are now our target group on the estate. The estate has lots of potential due to its size and original design. It was actually built in the 1950s on the remains of a pony racing ground. There are many green areas around the estate, but these are predominantly just grassy areas, as you can see here, so kind of vast expanses of, of just grass. Um, so these are generally underused by the community and have little environmental benefit. There are numerous hubs on the estate, uh, including schools, children's centers, scouts hub, a church and a GP, all of whom we've either worked with in the past or are hoping to work with in the future. So to begin with, we started out by working on the estate on a number of smaller projects and gaining resident input on future work. And in 2019, we were lucky to secure a large grant from the National Lottery, which is lasting until 2023. So that means we're now able to deliver more in-depth and long-term greening activities with the residents. As part of the project, we're also undertaking extensive monitoring and evaluation. Uh, and this is to capture successes and learnings in the hopes of rolling this out in other estates in London and beyond. Uh, so this is just to give you kind of um, the scale of the estate. It's got over 1,500 dwellings of various types, ranging from terrace houses to high-rise blocks of flats. And the estate has a very diverse demographic of residents, most of whom do not have private gardens. So as you can see here, it's quite built up around the outside. And then inside, there's a park called North Hall Park. And it was actually where the old uh, racing track used to be. So since the beginning of the project, we've engaged over 1,000 residents, over half of whom are children. 
which is great as children, parents and carers are a key target group on the estate. And this also aligns well with our wider work, which takes a generational approach to urban greening. The engagement has been through numerous consultation events and workshops, planting activities and family fun days. We've since planted 200 large trees, planted thousands of bulbs, hundreds of plants and saplings, created new seating and built raised beds for fruit and vegetable growing. Over the past year, we've been delivering as much of our planned activities as possible in a COVID secure way. We're lucky that most of our activities take place outside. Um, so here are just some photos from our activities on the estate since the project's begun. Um, so before COVID, we would run large community events where we'd get, you know, dozens and dozens of people out uh, together to come take part in some sort of planting activity, but also really just to come and meet their neighbours, you know, listen to some nice music, have some delicious food and just generally a really fun community day out. Um, and since COVID, we've been running smaller family bubbles and support bubble workshops. So basically, you know, people come for, for a shorter time um, engaging the activity. And then unfortunately you have to go rather than mingle, uh, but it still means that people have been able to come out and, and take part this year, which is very good, especially when everyone's been stuck indoors most of the year. Uh, so beyond tree planting, a key focus of our work on the estate is to create community gardens, which could be central community hubs for residents to spend time together, grow food together, where children can play, residents can come together to have barbecues. Um, so this is just one example uh, of a design that we delivered this past year, which is now largely complete. Um, and it incorporates uh, a range of different elements, including seating, uh, wildlife hedgerows, an orchard, habitat wall, uh, and additional access to the park, the North Hall Park, which I mentioned earlier. So yeah, kind of putting it all together in one and really creating a space where people can come and spend time. So our overall aims of the project are very much at the cross section of environment and community. Through tree planting and other greening activities, we can provide regular opportunities for residents to meet their neighbors, get outdoors and get active. From our experience, we've seen how involving residents in planting increases care and respect for the natural environment and decreases negative activities such as vandalism. Throughout our project, we also plan to set up a, a resident screening group so that by the end of the funded work, this group is able to carry on activities into the future, ensuring the project's sustainability. So I just wanted to read out quickly uh, a quote from one of our lovely long-term volunteers on the estate, and just to give you a flavor of why she's been involved. So she says, I wanted to meet like-minded members of my local community who share an interest in making the area in which we live greener and more sustainable. I also wanted to develop a sense of belonging and community cohesion as a result of the project. As a result of the greening activities, the project has been perfect for bringing people together while simultaneously developing and encouraging the use of the green spaces around us. It's been a great project to be involved in. And I also just wanted to cover a few challenges that we faced um, just to kind of get the conversation going and maybe hear from others how they've experienced uh, greening work on estates. So of course, COVID has been a challenge this past year, as it has for everyone. Restrictions on social distancing has meant we've been unable to bring residents together, which is one of our main aims of the project. We found there's not been a huge take up for online engagement with the project when compared to in-person events. Um, and we've also had to put some things on hold like creating the friends group as it was just too unrealistic to try and set that up remotely as people were really keen to actually you know, get their hands dirty. Um, but with restrictions now easing, we look forward to hosting big community events again this summer. And um, Racecourse is a huge estate, not as big as Thames Mead, uh, but still quite big. And bal balancing resident needs and requests for the outdoor environment can be challenging. For example, one challenge we've encountered this year is when we created a garden structure around existing bins within one of the blocks. Uh, this included some raised beds with flowers and a trellis. Um, whilst the solution to hide the bins was requested by residents in the first place, the new structure has been greatly received by other residents. So the lesson there is without a representative body of all the residents, such as a Tenants Residents Association, a TRA, it is difficult to get kind of clear democratic consensus on certain elements. Um, and this leads me well into my next point, which is about acknowledging the limits to our remit as an environmental charity and not the landowner or the council. So we're kind of coming at it from a different angle than Peabody. Um, we found we can sometimes become the middleman between the residents and the council on issues that we're just not in a position to fix, like lighting or uneven pavements. And lastly, community building and environmental impact take 
takes time. Um, so whilst we expect a lot of short term results, it can take years to see the long lasting change we ultimately hope to achieve. Um, so I will leave it there. Uh, please do send through any questions. I'll be happy to answer them later on. Just here's some links as well to our, our website and our social. Thanks for everyone for listening. Thanks so much, Claudia. That was really great. And spot on time. Well, even ahead of time. Goodness, you could keep going if you want. <laughs> no, it was really great, really interesting. And um, we've got a, a bunch of uh, questions there as well. Uh, that are popping up. Um, in actual fact, well, I might just um, ask a couple of questions uh, now, if that's all right, seeing that we've got a couple of moments. Um, the species um, of trees, uh, how how were they um, how were they selected um, to b benefit the area? Do you know? Uh, on race scores, yeah, yeah. So, so we've got an in-house kind of um, arboricultural team who, who are experts in choosing the right tree for the right place. Um, so they would consider, you know, a range of different things like the soil and the shading, um, just the general kind of environment in the local area, what other trees are on the estate. Uh, but then also the kind of social side of things too. So we've planted a lot of, you know, edible trees to, to really encourage people to come out and and do foraging and kind of using the spaces much more. So yeah, there's a whole range of list of criteria of, of how trees get chosen. And obviously in collaboration with, with the council and then with the residents, you know, people get to really speak what they like to see there. Yeah. And were there any um, residents that were keen on actually watering the trees themselves or is that um, left up to the housing provider or the council? Yeah, so with watering, we do that for the first three years. So we're contracted to kind of make sure the initial establishment period um, is, is done. And then after that, uh, they don't really need watering that much and hopefully we'll be able to more or less spend for themselves. Um, but any future maintenance that might be necessary, uh, that will go to the council. Yeah. So things like removing cages or potentially kind of formative pruning on the fruit trees. But again, you know, because we want to engage the, the friends group, um, create a friends group and engage more residents, we'll be looking to, to get them more involved in, in the kind of maintenance elements as well. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Claudia. Um, OK, uh, if I can now welcome uh, Alan Cook to present. Um, Alan has been the secretary of both Craven Vale Community Association in Brighton and for the Friends of Craven Wood for the past 10 to 12 years. He's not only a fundraiser, he's a volunteer raiser too. And his love of trees has uh, led to the planting of many trees throughout Craven Vale Estate. So uh, a warm welcome to you, Alan. Thank you, Christina. I'll just share my screen. Sure. And uh, go to the slideshow. <coughs> Come on. Please put it up. All right, hopefully you can all see that. I'm getting a thumbs up sign, Claudia. Uh, so Christina, can yeah, you see that? Uh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we can see that now. Right. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so let, let's go back one. Just a quickie introduction. Uh, some of you will know Brighton, that's the Palace Pier there. That's the area we're interested in today, Cravenvale Housing Estate, which is that small portion there, and the adjoining piece, which we've labeled Craven Wood, which we'll get onto. Um, that was what it looked like in 1946, an aerial view. It was all down to allotments, the whole area. Uh, the land had been chalk down land until about 1850 when it was enclosed, sold to the council in 1920s and turned over to allotments because the council didn't know what else to do with the land. Uh, then in the 1950s, they built the estate. You can see it's pretty low density at the time, nothing more than three stories. Um, and that is, you, you don't get a, a hint of the topology there, we'll, we'll get onto the fact that it's quite a steep sided valley. This is the dip slope on which uh, the houses were built and the scarp slope of the valley is here. Uh, all uh, lots 
we inherited that hedge there, which was a hedge of el uh, a row of elm trees planted in about 1880, 1890. Um, that's Brighton General Hospital, that's the race course. Um, so we're high up, a mile from the coast and 350 feet up. So it's a quite challenging place to live and to plant trees. That gives you a bit more idea of the topography. Um, so the house is built 1950s, low density. We really benefited from that and a large amount of green space in between. And the other side of the valley, we've got a much steeper slope on which they wisely decided they shouldn't put council housing. Um, and that's the helipad on top of Brighton's Sussex Hospital. Uh, and the sea, obviously, great view from most people living on the estate. We did inherit a few trees, so they said these are home oaks, which no records, but must be implanted in the 1950s to have grown to that kind of size already. And there were one of the two trees planted around the estate um, before we became involved. So, for example, this is a group of white beams, which um, I'm told are Swedish white beams, I'm not quite confident, but uh, the council did do some planning are making the place look attractive. But again, you see the kind of slopes we're dealing with. And uh, thanks to uh, Vivian Barton, who's done a list of all the important trees in Brighton, I was surprised to find we actually had the uh, tallest Jacqueline Hillier in the country. Um, one of the many types of elm trees, which Brighton is well known for, um, it's difficult to believe, but that can only be 50, 60 years old because on the original map, on the original photograph of the estate, there were no trees visible at all. Come to think of it, there were no cars either. In those days, when this was built, uh, council tenants were not expected to own cars. Uh, but we do suffer from climatic problems. This is uh, the Im impact of the southwest winds coming straight off salt-laden southwest winds coming off the sea. So these hawthorns are nearing the end of their life, um, but they, they've done well to make the place look more attractive uh, and uh, also provide shelves to people in bad conditions. Here we see um, some more hawthorns which are, have basically come to the end of their lives. That one there was chopped down a few years ago and another one there um, so the arboriculture team of the council have looked after those. Meanwhile, we have planted a large number of whips, planted about a hundred whips across the say, various small trees, hawthorns and other thorns. These ones were planted by the council about 15 years ago. That's a Norway maple and there's some more um, holm oaks, badly located because it impacts on traffic's visibility to see what's coming down the hill at high speed. Um, okay, so what happened is nothing else much happened. The council did not really mind us getting on and looking after our stay, but it was really down to the association, the community association to say, look, we've got a lot of boring grass. Uh, the we, we are there really for the community. We're not really tree planters, but we came to the conclusion that with the community that it was important to have trees planted. This was the first one we arranged, I think about 12 years ago. That one actually didn't succeed. We must have done something wrong there. But at a later stage, we've been working with Brighton Permaculture organization based in the north of Brighton, who helped us put a wide variety of fruit trees across the estate. Of course, fruit trees, basically, they, they are attractive. You have lovely blossom. And of course, as mentioned earlier by um, the previous speaker, it provides foraging opportunities. So we've got a wide variety of apples, plums, pears. We've also got walnuts and figs. Uh, so a wide variety of trees we've planted across the area. And this is the map today, that's the estate, all the little colored dots 
uh, where we had planted trees up until 2012. Um, we've got a few extra ones filling up the gaps. We've got very few gaps left now. So we've basically stopped planting trees in this area because I think we've just about reached, um, not saturation, we could always plant more, but uh, it's, it's enough to keep the people occupied and, and happy. And you see, we have some hidden behind blocks. So only the people living in that block can see those, but who, that doesn't matter. We're providing for everybody. Uh, this is the Brighton per Permaculture team. That's Bryn helping us to look after the fruit trees which are between. You can see there that this particular tree was, although quite small, was developing large numbers of apples, which uh, we thinned so that most of the energy went into growing. This was taken a few years ago and uh, it's, it's now growing very well. Uh, we've worked with Brighton Permaculture. We haven't worked with Brighton Council, nothing against them, but it's been very much left to our own devices. So the community decided it wanted trees. Uh, the council said, okay, go ahead. And we've gone ahead. The council is now um, getting much more involved in helping groups around the city to plant trees. And Brighton Permaculture have been working with a large number of orchard areas across, across the town. So we are now, perhaps we were one of the first to start doing this locally, but it's been a success and it's being copied elsewhere. And I, I would suggest that uh, anyone you watching uh, has got an unresponsive council, just go ahead, just do it. Uh, so we were trained in the basics of looking after trees. Um, and this is what they look like earlier this year. Just a, a narrow passageway between houses. Uh, nothing special, just a piece of grass until we planted these two apple trees. See there, the sycamore would be on, which I'll get onto in a moment. And here's an avenue of trees we planted to celebrate the Jubilee 10 years ago or nine years ago. We plant, we made a new path. We, we put on quite a few extra paths as well because uh, a lot of the houses have difficult access with steps and stairs and slopes. And this one, which we call Jubilee Walk, we um, have planted a row of apple trees along. This was the early, earlier Norway maple and um, Whole oaks. We've got about 350 houses on the estate, so um, and most of them are single people. So we've probably got about 600 people resident on the, on the estate. And the main objective is to try and get them to become involved in their community. And this is one way of getting people to become involved in their community, is to help them appreciate the area they're living in. I mean, in a sense, most estates are dormitories. You come home, you shut the door, you put the television on, you go to bed. And it, it is difficult to get people out and meeting each other. I'm sure we've all got those sort of problems. But this has been one way of developing a community spirit. And that's uh, witnessed by the apiary, uh, sorry, by the wassail that we held just before lockdown started. Uh, with the local Morris men coming along and doing a, a wassail ceremony in the cold of January. Um, that was one of the earliest trees we planted about 10 years ago. And uh, surprisingly, or well, not surprisingly, after having been doused with cider this last summer, it really gave us a hell of a mountain of fruit. <laughs> it was great to see. And then, as I say, adjacent to the state, the old allotments became a sycamore wood over the past 40 years because the slope and the thinness of the chalk soil, the allotments never really took off. So they were just left. And uh, with a, a grant, we've transformed that into a wide variety of habitats, providing tranquility and beauty and planting a wider variety of trees. As I say, the steep slopes prevented any expansion of the estate onto the land. And the lottery gave us money to uh, well, I think we've built about 150 steps on the estate on, on the woodland to help people get around it. Um, that is 
the so, barrier for housing estate on the left and Cravenwood on the right, marked by this long row of elm trees, English elms, and we've we still keep losing a handful, two or three each year to um, Dutch elm disease, but generally speaking, they're doing well and we're getting natural regeneration of witch elms in the wood, which is always pleasing to see. This is the main area we cleared the moors, and that area now is a hazel coppice. That area now hosts about 18 or six varieties of apples, which we have planted. Uh, we have never tended, we've let nature have its way. Um, we mulched them twice, but apart from that, we left them to their own devices and they're absolutely thriving. It's great to see, and people enjoy coming up into this wood to participate. This is just a picture of Paul, who is our ch the chief ranger in Brighton. He looks after the Friends of Craven Wood because it is council land we are, if you like, playing around with. That was Grant who set up the whole scheme for the community and the mayor at the time. So planting trees was great fun for volunteers and it is all volunteers, there are not many of us, but um, that's the kind of thing we now have, apart from the hazels and the apples, we planted about 300 miscellaneous trees across the area, we planted meadows, uh, I think uh, silver birch there, some willows and all sorts of hornbeams, all kinds of things which really taken well on this, as you see, one in three slope. Uh, and uh, it's not just the people who benefited from it. We did a count of butterflies before we started. We had um, five varieties of butterfly when it was purely uh, sycamores. Okay, one of them was quite a rare one, the white letter, which lives at the top of the white little hair streak, which lives at the top of the elm trees. But from five, we now come to 27 species of butterflies. So we're quite pleased at the way that that has developed. And that's what we've provided for our residents. Place to sit, place to enjoy life, a place to look at the sea and Brighton and, and to get away from the sea and Brighton. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. That's just amazing. It looks like you've done incredible work. I mean, having a look at those uh, before photos and now what it has become is just, it's mind blowing what you can do. Um, I've got a, a bunch of questions for you, but it's going to have to wait for another time. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, but last but not least, uh, I'd like to introduce everyone to Mike Jen. Mike is a volunteer and activist who founded the Camden Forest in 19, 19, 20, 2019 with the uh, view to plant 2,025 trees by the year uh, 2025. <laughs> Too many numbers. <laughs> um, the concept is borough wide, but it goes uh, beyond just distributing trees. Uh, what I noticed um, on their website was that uh, each tree is mapped um, and then each participant is actually encouraged to share their tree planting story. And so now there's hundreds of tree stories around the borough. So Mike, thank you very much. Please share your story with us. Right, hello there. I hope Hi. you can hear me and everything. Um, yeah, this is what happens when somebody, uh, you know, an individual just gets um, going, I suppose, really. Uh, I was motivated by global warming. I was thinking when we'd better plant some trees. Um, I calculated that if I had the trees, I could probably give away about, literally give away to people from anywhere, about um, 20 trees a, a, on a Saturday. Uh, and I would do that for 20 Saturdays and that would be 400 trees. And if I did that for five years, that would be a couple of thousand trees. Um, and I was able to get those trees from the Trust for Conservation Volunteers, um, which was just the absolutely key item. I mean, in one sense, that's the only funding we've had. We've been, everything else has not required any money. Um, it's very important that the name, the Camden Forest, it's a motivating name. Uh, the idea that your borough has a forest um, 
is, uh, seems to work very, very well with people. Everybody likes the idea. The idea also of having a, a target of having 225 trees or 2,025 trees by 2025 is also quite motivating. It's a specific thing you're aiming for and uh, it's caused people to come around the idea um, and, and get involved in, in handing these trees out. The method of doing this was to, um, uh, was to um, aim at people's home gardens, uh, domestic gardens. So that's a picture of me standing outside in Kentish Town High Street. And this is the method of doing it. It's still literally to stand there and then you cut, a shopper comes along and you say, would you like a tree? Uh, they're not out to get a tree. They wouldn't think of that as a, <laughs> on their shopping list. Uh, and what I found is that I, on an average Saturday, um, about 25 people an hour would take a tree from me. Uh, we also went to places like the farmer's markets. Uh, this is one that's opposite the far West Hampstead farmer's market um, and stood there. And again, it's around about 25 an hour, uh, depending where you are, might be 20 an hour, could be 30 an hour in some farmer's markets. Um, so it's really about how long you want to spend doing it. Um, as to how many trees to give away. Um, so this has been this happening with a, a group of people. This is another group of people in Haringey. So what we're interested in is the idea that Haringey, that, you know, that, that there's a Haringey forest or there's, there's a, a Barnet forest or a, a Southwark forest or whatever. These are the, the forest, of course, is the actual trees, not the, um, we're just a support group. But the idea that you're doing what you can to support that forest in that area um, is is what uh, I hope will make people come together and focus on it. Um, of course, you can do, um, uh, you know, there's other ways of going about the same, same uh, way of doing it, and I'll come on to the estates part of it in a moment. But the results, I mean, we've been, we've, this is two, two winters we've had. We've given a thousand trees away. Now, I suppose, I don't I suppose, that we know where all of those have gone to exactly because we've just given them to people to plant in their own gardens. Gardens are something like 24% of the land mass of London. Um, a huge, huge potential for, uh, for planting. Um, from what I can see looking around, a lot of gardens are not cared for. So, you know, one's got a lot, a lot of encouragement. Um, but those trees, some of those trees have been handed out. Um, uh, you know, you've got, what you've got here is a picture of somebody just receiving one. Uh, this a slightly advanced of where I'm at. I'll come, I'll come back to that. We'll leave that one on the screen now for a moment because it's, uh, I've got to catch up with, with these, just these few, uh, very few uh, shots I've got um, to use. So we've, we've, we've been um, involved in schools. There's, there's school programs, you know, uh, curriculum issues based around trees that we've handed children. Um, and the teachers have come around it and they've, they've given their um, uh, terrific input into the whole thing. Um, a, a feminist garden at the Parliament Hill School, every tree named after a famous feminist and so on, 50 children helped plant those. So some lovely, lovely outcomes from all of this. Um, it's amazing how motivating trees can be. So we've also helped to support another group, which used the Mirawaki method of uh, tree planting, uh, sometimes now called Tiny, for Tiny Forests, and they put 1,300 trees on, on some Thames waterland up, and, up at Highgate. Um, so we then, this year, turned our attention to estates, um, not solely, but that was one of the things that we, um, uh, we were looking at. How could we get uh, trees into a state? So we put a, 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 uh, a notice in the housing, uh, the council's housing newsletter. Um, we've got a picture of that somewhere on the, uh, in the, amongst these couple of other remaining photographs. Yes, that's right. So it's very, very simple. <laughs> it basically invites people, it tells us who they are, and it says, you know, if you'd like a, to have a tree, um, get in touch with us. And, um, uh, that worked quite well. We got 75 requests. Um, we had about a uh, request for about 200 and, uh, 205 trees were requested. Some of those came from individuals and some of those come from the heads of TRA. Uh, um, and those TRAs were being maybe asking for 10, 12 or whatever. They would then um, have to work out how they were going to uh, get those planted in, in, um, in conjunction with the uh, housing authorities. 
and uh, um, I don't know a great deal about how that's actually gone personally, um, but I'm sure they've worked out a solution to it. Um, the uh, some people have requested trees for the for the future, so we you know we're, we're planning to deliver some more in autumn. Along with the this request came um, people saying, "Well, I can't get to you. Can you come to us?" So we said yes. We would. So we, we formed a team of recyclists. Nice little twist on the word. So the re, the recyclists um, uh, delivered a lot of these trees to the to the individuals. Um, and when it came to the fact that some people would require trees in pots, well, we couldn't do that on bikes. So um, cars had to be used to, to deliver those. Um, what did we learn from all this? Uh, I mean, apart from the fact you need to give planting advice. I mean, this is, this is an instance where we delivered 50, 50 uh, pots to um, uh, Phoenix Estate, which is just beside, that's the Crick building in the background in case you, any of you have come across that wonderful thing in St Pancras. Um, so we've delivered 50 pots here and we'll be, um, and the trees obviously to go with it. Um, so uh, obviously you need to give planting advice. So we've been referring people to um, the, the mayor's uh, website, which has got excellent advice on there. So we've um, backed people up in that respect. We've, um, what we've learned from it is we think there's a, there's a real appetite on, on estates for people to get involved. I mean, there's, there's a lot of enthusiasm. Um, the, um, uh, we think this council could do more if they, some of the departments um, manage to talk to each other a bit better in planting hedges and, and trees. But I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a great borough and a lot, a lot does happen, but you can always see there's more can be achieved. Um, some of the people want to get involved in get, in doing more, giving trees away and that kind of thing. So we're, we're going to build up a smaller, a small or a bigger team than we've currently got. Um, and I think uh, in future, though, we won't be handing trees probably to, I mean, probably won't be handing any trees. Uh, it's going to be tr um, uh, shrubs um, that are going to go in the tubs um, instead of trees. Probably, we're still discussing that at the moment. In fact, there's a meeting coming up next week about it as to what we, which, which um, offer we will actually make next year. We've had some brilliant comments, absolutely fantastic comments from people, and it's interesting to see what people's motivations are. I mean, some is about climate change, some is about planting in memory of uh, someone else. That's where we get a lot of our stories from about people that they have planted in, uh, a tree in memory of. Um, people trying to replace some of the trees that HS2 have taken away, uh, people um, planting trees as, as a companion. I mean, it's very touching, that sort of thing, where you get, um, uh, I mean, Caroline said, I have a small flat in the Brunswick Centre and a room for a tree next to my lemon, which kept me sane all through lockdown. I'm visually and mobility disabled and very pleased to have two of your very lovely trees delivered last weekend. So, you know, just really as a, company, <laughs> really. Um, people do things with children, uh, with the trees. I mean, a lot of motivation around uh, getting children involved in, in natural things, about planting things in a little space somewhere so you can meet up with a, a group of neighbours and use the trees as a, a focus, as we've seen with some of the other uh, presentations. Um, some people concerned about uh, pollution and in, uh, insects, loss of insects and so on. So all sorts of different motivations um for for being involved um and lots of lovely outcomes really um so i think that's probably enough for me thank you very much <laughs> thank you so much mike that was really interesting and i've just been watching some of the comments that have been coming up and we have a few camden residents here all right. <laughs> um <laughs> don't worry <laughs> It's all good news. Yeah. Um, they're very thankful for the um, project. So uh, Carolyn had, uh, had said that she's got a, uh, a rowan and a dog rose on, on her balcony and she says, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, there's uh, someone who's in our left Camden, but is very excited about the, um, the, uh, 
the whole program that you're putting together. So yeah, great news there. Um, right, I think we are at a time where we can um, start asking questions and my goodness, are there some questions? <laughs> I don't think we're going to get through them all. Um, we're certainly not going to get through them all, but um, I perhaps might direct a couple to Phil um, just initially. Um, Phil, uh, one of the questions um, that uh, came about was, uh, how is a Peabody balancing long-term maintenance of trees? Um, and in amongst that question, I, I'm hoping I'm interpreting the question correctly. Is there an appetite to balance the maintenance with your tree economics work? And also what software do you um, use to manage your trees throughout the estate? <coughs> okay. Um... Uh, so taking the first part, I mean, um, I think it's fair to say that so, so Peabody, Peabody got involved and acquired really Thames Media 2014. Um, and um, I think it's fair to say that before then, the sort of management of the green spaces, including the trees, um, was, uh, was fairly restricted. Um, budgets were low. Um, and um, it was a sort of very um, uh, on-demand type approach. We're starting to change that now and be more proactive, hence the work on thinking about the future. Um, we, we've got a very long-term view of Thamesmead, um, and in terms of thinking about that long-term management and maintenance, we are currently investigating how we might set up and put together some form of long-term stewardship plan. At the moment, we don't quite know what that will be. Um, it's a it's a complex thing which we're doing and in fact many other people we know are wrestling with 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 this um you know should we set up a trust or something not sure yet um i'll come back in a year and ask me and i'll be able to tell you much more about that but in preparation for that clearly one of the things we need to do is understand our assets far better um so so a number of tools that we use as i say we're currently um using the sort of tree economics approach to give us a bit more data um, about what we've got and the value of it in various different ways um, and you know we'll know far more in a, in a few weeks time. We um, have a we're, we're lucky in a way we've got a GIS system which allows us to plot um, all of our assets including trees in Thamesmead and we're developing that and adding more all the time so that means that we've got sort of good uh, good data on, on on what we've got and we've got we've got some really expert tree people within our environmental services team which we employ we don't outsource it's part of part of our Peabody work in Thamesmead um, so we're working really closely with them both in terms of um, analyzing what we've got but in terms of thinking about the future um, uh, and and that team uses a piece of software which I think is quite commonly used uh, in many local authorities called Confirm to help um, identify and work you know with with assets whether it be a lamp column or a tree um, so we're, we're applying, I hope, some sensible approaches to long term mapping. And the next step is then to sort of think about, well, OK, um, what, 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 what is the condition of the stock? What is its lifespan? Thinking about climate change, thinking about pests and diseases and thinking about where it is at the moment and how can we plan for a succession really going forward in the future? And I think one of the things which um, you know, I want to think about carefully is doing it over a period of time um, and involving the community. Most importantly, um, you know, we work with the community increasingly on co-design approaches and projects. Um, uh, and as I said in my talk, we really want to get people involved in their place, in their landscape. So hopefully that answers some of that. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, how are we going there, uh, Neil? We've um, got a less than a second I think before 11 o'clock I, th I think I think we can run over by a few minutes if, if people uh, want to there are some good questions to be answered I think great okay um, in that case uh, I have an open-ended question I don't think it's actually directed to um, anyone in particular but it is an interesting question and I think because of the style of webinar that this is which is really a first discussion and trying to pull everybody together, people from the community, people from housing providers, from councils, from NGOs, all talking about um, this particular topic, about how do we green um, 
social housing estates? How can we make them better? How do we, um, you know, get them greener? Um, it just reminds me that um, we are, that there are about 20, over 25 organisations throughout London who are working on something called the Urban Forest Plan. Um, and um, one of, there are many goals within this plan. Um, there are 11 main goals with multiple actions. And this particular webinar has come about from one of those goals where we want to work with social housing providers to develop uh, an enhancement program to increase tree canopy, climate change resilience, and resident well-being. And the three main goals are protecting and managing, growing and expanding, and promoting and supporting trees. That's a bit of a mouthful, but um, the question that had come on to the chat, uh, onto the Q&A was actually um, something along the lines, of, do various councils talk to each other about these projects? Now, I know that um, in the L London Urban Forest Plan, there is talk at that higher level, but on a day-to-day -day basis, um, talking and networking with people is exactly what we want to try and start to achieve. And this webinar is, we hope, the, the start of that. But it would be interesting to hear if uh, any of yourselves on the panel um, or, or Neil yourself um, could add to that at all. Oh, definitely silence. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I think um, one. Of, so we're we're doing a um, um, a project um, working in collaboration with a European funded project from GLA called Clever Cities, which is looking at nature based solutions to urban living, um, which is really interesting pioneering work. Um, and so, for example, we've used some um, uh, software which is actually originated in Germany called Green Pass, I think, if I remember correctly, to model the impact of you know, greening existing estates, um, uh, particularly around climatic sort of uh, changes, urban heat island effect, wind, etc. Um, and, and we can demonstrate that, you know, the sort of planting, some of which I showed you earlier, can, can have a dramatic impact on cooling, because some of these spaces can get, especially in, in our hotter summers, uh, uh, or hotter weather can get quite inhospitable, let's say. So, um, so I think I think there are some real positives there in terms of just making people's doorsteps, if you like, more habitable and humane. Um, I would just like to just say that I think that the key to getting um, significant involvement in states is the involvement of people who are, uh, as it were, leaders by nature in their uh, in those on those estates. So um, I would I would be suggesting that people the organisations uh, identify who the who the thought leaders are as you were on on the estate, and give them as much responsibility as you can. Stand back as far as you can. Let them get on with it. If you give them the resources and and the goal, um, see what happens when you uh, let them go. I, th I think that kind of approach is 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 well demonstrated by Ellen's um, Ellen's initiative yeah. in, in Brighton, yeah. actually. Um, which is it's slightly disappointing that with the Green Council there wasn't more support forthcoming from yes. uh, the council. But nonetheless, um, I think given that that, um, that they did get support from Brighton Permaculture and um, some council officers, that's a good start. Uh, but hopefully, a beginning uh, and not an end. <laughs> Sorry, yes, um, I would just add, if there are any community volunteers out there, just go ahead and wait to be told you can't do it. <laughs> um, actually, uh, Alan, one, one question, I'm not sure whether I read it or whether I made up the question myself, actually, was, um, do you run the risk of the landowner charging uh, higher rates if you start introducing... So if, so for instance, the housing provider is um, got a budget for cutting just an expanse of grass, but suddenly they have to maneuver in and around trees and it takes much um, longer time. Does that, has that influenced um, rates in your experience or, okay, or well, not? It hasn't affected us because we've got a very good working relationship with the leadership of the, um, 
the people who cut the grass. And the chap who leads the team is very into um, wildflowers and everything else. And uh, he's pleased that we're planting trees. So we are fortunate in that we've uh, maintained a good relationship with the grass cutting team. They're on our side. <laughs> That's good, good to hear. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, uh, uh, Neil, do you want to pitch in with some questions? I've got a couple here, uh, but. Yeah, I mean, just thinking, Carolyn Moyer is asking um, a really important question, I think, particularly given, I think, comments that Phil and Alan made about saying new, new trees are always great, but shouldn't we be cherishing and valuing the older middle aged trees on council help, council estates? Um, arguably, these are the ones that actually do do most to help mitigate, you know, climate change impacts and uh, uh, and actually are aesthetically very pleasing, even though they might offer some challenges in terms of um, tree management. I don't know whether anyone's got any comments on that. I mean, I, I absolutely agree, um, and um, uh, we, of course, should be doing that. In, 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 in an area which we did a lot of work last year, we unfortunately had to remove quite a few trees because they were either had been poorly maintained for a very long time or had some fairly gruesome tree surgery done to them, um, but we retained some key ones um, and, of course, planted new ones as well so that we can think about that succession. I think one of the risks in some older places like Thamesmead is that trees, is there has been no succession plan um, and trees have been allowed to develop. And in some cases, particularly in that sort of, um, in those, in a place like Thamesmead, a lot of the trees are things like poplars, um, which are great, of course, fantastic, fast growing. And we definitely want to encourage things like black, black poplars, um, which we have a few of, and we want to take those and, and plant more of those but in courtyard spaces, they can get a bit overbearing. Um, so it's, it's trying to get the right mix and thinking, of course, about what we've got, but thinking about succession, I think it's so important when there hasn't really been a lot of new tree planting for decades, probably 30, 40 years in some cases. Yeah, I think that, that's a good, good, good. I don't know whether anyone else wants to come in on that, but there is, I think we might have to wrap up in a few minutes to allow mm. people to, to go, um, because I know other people people here have um, other things to be getting on with. But there's a there's a really um, interesting question, which really goes to the number it really from Paula Chatfield in the Q&A panel, which, where she talks about how she says, well, how do we make connections with housing associations to support their work with trees, please? As a volunteer tree warden in Chichester, Sussex, we have so many opportunities is within our ex-council estates but literally can't find anyone in hired housing to respond to us in the meantime we're losing trees etc etc she's saying is there a housing association network where housing associations share experiences can help each other with strategic practical tree matters who would be the strategic lead please i think this is a really good set of questions and one of the issues that we've been trying to communicate with the umbrella organization for housing associations and rsls which is the national housing federation i think have a have a critical role to play here and we're looking forward to engaging with the National Housing Federation and their members to see how we can achieve progress across the board in this in this area because there are some systemic issues I mean I'm very conscious of it myself personally living on a, an LNQ estate um, where you know tree management tree maintenance green space management and maintenance is obviously outsourced uh, and not terribly well um, attended to in my experience uh, and I don't think that's a, a unique experience. I think I think housing associations have a lot, uh, a lot to be um, doing to improve improve practice in this area. And this is the kind of thing that we see Perry London and Trees for Cities and other partners involved in delivering the Urban Forest Plan in London are keen to to do. Neil, I'm just I'm just going to um, maybe make just a last note. Um, uh, Robin um, has um, mentioned uh, that it would be great if people fed in their ideas and um, how community involvement is or isn't working, what support is needed, and I would suggest that that goes beyond uh, just the community, but um, it would be just really fantastic to be able to hear more about uh, people's experiences, the challenges they've had, what opportunities people are pursuing um, and ideas and aspirations that people have, um, no matter what sort of realm you come from, I suppose. Um, again, I want to reiterate that this is the start of a conversation and we really want to um, build on this. And I think it's just 
so exciting to see so many of you here today. Um, I, I'm not quite sure we expected so many people to come along, so it's been brilliant. Um, I, I think, um, as you said, Neil, we might need to wrap up. So um, just while I'm uh, prattling on, <laughs> I'd just really like to thank um, all our presenters um, for sharing their experiences um, with us this morning. I've found it really fascinating and really interesting. I can see from the comments and the questions that other people have as well. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, and um, Neil, I'd like to thank you as well and everyone involved in the Urban Tree Festival who uh, made this webinar happen. Um, I think it's been really fantastic. Um, so just a, a one question, a technical question from me, Neil, is this presentation, will this presentation be available for? Yes, for yes, and, and I, I think some people may have noticed that, that the, the session is being recorded uh, and it will be uploaded to the um, Urban Tree Festival um, YouTube um, site. Um, uh, fairly soon, so if you want to sort of um, go back over some of the presentations uh and um and maybe share it with share a link with your colleagues or or, or um, other members of your community then uh then please do so uh, i've just put a, a link to the um to the rest of the urban tree festival program in the chat and um, there are other webinars coming up including one at lunchtime today on urban hedges um and um another um uh, tomorrow um, thursday on um urban trees and climate change there are a number of questions we didn't really get to in terms of the benefits of tree planting and urban trees for climate change mitigation and uh, that you can bring up those issues on Thursday at lunch, uh, lunchtime if you like at the um, webinar we have then uh, and then we have um, a couple over the weekend one on uh, how should we value trees uh, a philosophical discussion uh, chaired by Peter Fines the author and um, finally we have a session on campaigning for trees uh, on Sunday uh, between three and four do look at the website if you want to sign up to any of those um, I, and uh, all I can say is to thank Christina for chairing and everyone else for their fantastic presentations and for all the excellent questions. Thank you very much. As Christina said, this is a start of a discussion, not the end. So we hope to see you again at some point on this very important issue. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank thanks you so much. much.